Ladies and gentlemen, great to see everybody. Welcome, welcome to one and all. Very good to have everybody tonight. Well, welcome to the Mary Heiken Dumont Jewish University here at Anche Sfarad Beth Lameth Congregation. And we do remember each year Mary Heiken Dumont, who was a beloved member of our congregation, lived many years across the street, was very generous to our congregation, and her children continued that generosity and sponsored this Mary Heiken Dumont series. So we appreciate uh, her, and we remember her today. He's a Baruch, may her memory be a blessing. And may all you, you, of you be blessed for coming out to, to study tonight and learn about uh, gematria, numerology, science, or hoax. Right? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's science in that we're dealing with numbers. Come on in. We're, it's science in that we deal with numbers. And as you see here, uh, we take a letter, like the Aleph, the first letter on the top right, and we say it's one. We take the next letter, bet, we say it's two. We go all the way to 10, and then we start with 20s. So second, second row, we have a 20 and 30. The chaf is a, is, is a 20, the lamed is a 30. We go until we get to 90. And then, uh, yes, uh, uh, Marty, uh, could, could you? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, we go till, till, till uh, 90, and then when we get to 100, we just go 100, 200, 300, and 400. And when we get to, when we get to 400, that's it. As Jews, we don't need anything over 400. It's enough. It's enough. 400 years of slavery. It's a, so 400 is a big number. And uh, just to show how big it is, the Jews were told they'd be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Rabbi Harlap at Yeshiva University suggested that 400 meant like a really long time. That's 400. So that's the highest number is 400. Now, <clears throat> so if the, each letter has a value, then every word has a value. And then instead of just looking at the Torah as a bunch of stories, we suddenly have uh, a Torah in which every word you could try to figure out, well, what's the relationship between this word and that word? Maybe there's a secret hiding inside of this word which is related to something else. Uh, and maybe you could even, maybe some letters are interchangeable. Maybe, um, maybe there are letters that uh, you could arrange the alphabet in a different way. You could say that, that the one is equal to 400, that the, the, the aleph is related to the taf, and then the shin is related to the bet. There are all kinds of ways. Maybe you could chop the alphabet into three different, different equal portions, and, uh, and that way, and you could, you could do it that way. So there's so many different ways. It's so much fun, and it's so exciting. But the question is, is it, is it science or hoax? Meaning, let's say we found that my name represented the Mashiach. So, so what does that mean? I don't know. A lot of people have the same name that I do. So, so what does it mean? So uh, how, do you, uh, how, do, how do you put the stop on it? So, and uh, how significant uh, is it? How serious is it? You know, we take Midrash pretty seriously. For instance, if we say that that's how we interpret this verse, then that's serious and it's, in a, it's enforceable in a Jewish court of law, right? Uh, right? If the woman is divorced, if she follows uh, this midrashic interpretation of the divorce, she's not divorced if you, don't, if you, if you follow that midrashic interpretation of the, of the divorce. So these things have teeth to them. But what about this methodology of midrash? Is this a serious methodology of midrash? Or is this sort of just sort of like a fun methodology of midrash? That's, that's the question. So firstly, what is gematria? What, is, what kind of word is that? Usually Hebrew words only have three letters. If you see a long word, like long numbers, uh, it's, not, it's not Hebrew. So what is it? So you have here uh, three theories. Number one, you have the Tosfot Yontov. Uh, he was a bit of a modernist a few hundred years ago, and he said, uh, it's probably a Greek word. It has something to do with you know, geometry or something, you know, measurements, engineering, something like that, calculations. The, um, the Beit Yosef said, Greek? Uh, the, 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 the Jewish numbers are are some sort that a Jewish word, an important word like this, comes from Greek, phooey. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to say that. So rather, it must be from two Aramaic words, Hebrew, combination Hebrew and Aramaic and uh, Arabic kind of words. Gay, a uh, gay, gay means a valley. And meturaya uh, means, uh, means, uh, means a hill. So it's the valleys and the hills, the words are the mountains, and the interpretation, the gematria, the numerology, is the valley. So maybe it's a Hebrew interpretation. Uh, however, uh, those who actually know Greek 
uh, which would exclude me, but uh, perhaps uh, we can ask, ask Jack on Shabbos, Jack Cohen. Uh, it's either, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, read Greek, but just in, in transliteration, it would be the Greek word grathma, number three, grathma, meaning uh, a letter or alphabet. It has to do with the alphabet. Or grammatias, uh, meaning scribe. So maybe it has to do with the alphabet. In any event, when we say gematria, we mean the numerology, the numeric value of that particular letter or word. Now, firstly, who says that you can make an interpretation based on, based on a, a midrash? And we're, we're going to give some examples of it later. But uh, for now, let's just say that, that, uh, uh, that, that if there was a word that had a particular value, then that might have a special, a special meaning. So who says you could do that? Well, you may have heard in the more early morning service, it says there are 13 hermeneutical principles, 13 principles of interpreting the Torah. Rabbi Ishmael lays them out, 13 principles. This is not one of them. <laughs> it's not one of them. There are, however, there is a longer list uh, called Rabbi Yossi Haglili's list, Rabbi Eliezer Benosha Rabbi Yossi Haglili's list. His list uh, has 32 hermeneutical principles. I'm sorry, it should be Rabbi Eliezer, son of Rabbi Yossi Haglili. He has 32 hermeneutical principles, and this is number 29. So it made it to the top 32 hermeneutical principles, the top 32 midrashic principles. So, now, when, who, when was that bright side, that outside source, when was it written? Well, it's not really referred to in the Talmud, so you assume it's a post-Talmudic work. The rabbi they associate it with is from the Mishnahic period. But anyway, um, the first time we, we find it is in the Mishnah and some early uh, Talmudic interpretations, we find it. One of the places we find it is in Pirkei Avod, Ethics of the Fathers. Rabbi Eliezer ben Chisma, a somewhat obscure rabbi, he says that there are certain things that are gufei halachos. There are certain things that are serious laws. But gematria, and also the calculation of astronomy, you know, when the new moon is and things like that, it's a parparot lechachma. Now parparot sometimes could mean forspeist, you know, the, the, the part of the meal that comes first, like the, is that the entree? I always get confused. The, the appetizer, okay. The, it's the, the appetizer before the meal. Uh, or maybe parparot are crumbs. It's just crumbs. The, the main course is Torah. We, Torah, you know it when you see it. But gematria, numerology, it's just crumbs. It's just, it's just, just is a sort of for fun. So this, so this Mishnah in Perkevot seems not to take this numerology too seriously, or at least on face value. Now, but then the question is, what did he mean by gematria? Well, remember, remember, we had two interpretations. One is sort of calculation, mathematics. Maybe the Mishnah is saying mathematics is very cute, but it's not Torah. Uh, or maybe it's saying, no, Midrashic interpretation of the Torah using numerology, that's what's cute, uh, and not real Torah. So we say, well, who is this Rebbe Lezer Chisma? So we look in the obscure passage in the Talmud, Horiot uh, 10a, and there it says that you think this guy is poor, Rabbi Lezer ben Chisma, he knows how to calculate how many drops there are in the ocean, and he barely has what to eat for lunch. So it mentions that, that, that Rabbi Lezer ben Chisma, the same rabbi who said that gematria is just fun, but not really Torah, it's not the body of Torah, he's a rabbi who counted the drops of, of, of water in the sea. So maybe he meant that counting, making calculations uh, of volume and things like that, that that wasn't so serious, but the midrashic tool of interpreting the Torah using numerology, that's very serious. It's not just the, the uh, what do you call it, the appetizer. No, it's the main course. So uh, we, have, we, we, have to, uh, we have to think about that. Now, if we look at some of the commentaries on that Mishnah in, in Avot, in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of the Fathers, we say, well, how, do, how does it classically interpret it to mean that gematria are just crumbs or an entree or, sorry, a... Uh, a, what do you call it again? An app appetizer <laughs> to the Torah. Rashi says, I'm sorry, every time I go to a restaurant, I get confused. What's the entree then? <laughs> anyway, but Rashi says, it's the dessert. So in the country, it's not the appetizer, it's the dessert. Torah is the main thing. You know when you see it. Numerology, figuring out what the numeric value of a particular word in the Torah, that's just dessert. The Midrash Shmuel, of the 16th century, says it's just not the main thing. Machsovitri in Days of Rashi, he says, it stimulates the appetite. You know, it's like an appetizer. It gets you going, but uh, it, it, the, the real, you should really be hungry for the, for the real thing, for the meat. 
The Aruch was an Italian dictionary from the, uh, let's see, Marty, um, Italian dictionary from the 10th century. He says, and it's an adornment to the Torah. Now that's a little different. It's an adornment to the Torah, right? It's not, a, it's not some kind of joke. It adorns the Torah. It embellishes it. Ibn Nachmias, and we have some people in town named Namias, they might be descendants of, of his, he says, it just crumbs. It has nothing, to, the word parperot can be crumbs, or they could be, uh, or parperot apat means uh, something that is, a, is, a, is a, an appetizer. So he takes the approach of the crumbs, the crumbs of Torah, it's just, it's just the crumbs, numerology, it's just the crumbs. The Maral, and you, those of you who have been to Prague may, may, be, may know the Maral of Prague, Rabbi Luria, he was a mystic, the famous rabbi who perhaps made a golem. He maybe he made some sort of monster or something using Kabbalah. So he says, no, it doesn't. This Mishnah that says, that demeans the practice of Gematria, this is not talking about the Midrashic practice of Gematria. This is talking about, about a math or something like that, of, of, uh, of, of, of the science of measuring. He says, like that rabbi, because he says, because the interpretation of the Torah using numerology is part of the body of Torah. So Rabbi Luria says that, on the contrary, numerology as an interpretation of the Torah is a very serious uh, adventure. Or venture. So let's now look at a spectrum of rabbis who take a look at this idea of gematria from those who take it not so seriously, we just saw some, to those who take it very seriously. And that's where we'll get into the mysticism and the Kabbalah. So people who don't take it seriously, what type, who's going to take this more seriously? Mystics or rationalists? Mystics. Mystics, okay. So one of the rationalists was Ibn Ezra. Uh, now, we say rationalists, we mean medieval rationalists, meaning he believed in astrology, but he was a rationalist. Okay, so. <laughs> but in any event, he believed in trying to minimize the amounts of, of miracles. Uh, apparently, there was a lot of pressure from the Muslims in his day, and also from the Karaites, who were making fun of various rabbinic and Jewish and, and, Bible and biblical things. And so he wanted to have as few uh, uh, anti-rational problems within our, our text so that he could get along best with his neighbors. So he was very big on that. So let's read what he says. One of the famous um, gematrias, and here's our first exa actual example, uh, is, it's found in the Gemara, and it's also found in the Medrash, in, in Medrash in the Nizarim, uh, page 32a. And that is, when Abraham saw that his nephew Lot was taken captive, so he mobilized 318 men, and together with the five local feudal lords of Canaan, they fought back and beat back the enemy from Mesopotamia, the four kings, and the five little kings beat the four, four big kings, and he saved his nephew Lot. Now, how many people did Abraham take with him? So it says, he got together his trainees, his inductees, 318. So listen to the Ibn Ezra about this. 318 men were on page two. The people, he, in the middle of the page, the people he trained many times for war. That's who he took with him, the people who were well-trained, his, 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 uh, those who he, he drafted. And the idea that the value of the letters is Eliezer, based on a Midrash, that's a Drash. It's not the simple meaning. For the verse does not speak in gematrias. For you could take out of it from the good and from the bad. From the good bad and from the, good, the, 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 the bad good. What does he say? So firstly, what did the rabbis say about this, that there were 318 soldiers? So the rabbis say, just like if you recall the story of Gidon, uh, Gidon wanted to fight with 3,000 men. God says, ah, you just fight with 300, it's good enough. You know, right? If you're going to do miracles, why do it with... Uh, with a lot of power, you can do it just with one, one finger. So he says, why say that Abraham won the war with 318 men? Let's say he won with one man. Who is the man? Eliezer. But it says he had 318 men. He said, no. 318 is the numeric value of Eliezer, his chief servant. Right? Because you could ask a question. If he, if he uh, come on in. If he, uh, if he took his men with him, why didn't he take Eliezer with him? Well, surely Eliezer must be there somewhere. He's hiding in the numerology. And if you look here, if you want to give an example, Eliezer, Aleph is 1, Lamed is 30, Yud is 10, Ayin is 70, Zion is 7, and 200. And those of you who are good with math, 
you will get to 318, hopefully. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do it a few times for you. Now, any, uh, anybody adding it up? It should work, good, good. It always did, so it's good that it still does. So, so comes Ibn Ezra and he says, anybody who says that, he says, that's a midrashic interpretation. It's not the simple meaning. And I've got it, I'm the guy who got, has to give the simple meaning. Because the first doesn't speak in gematrias. In other words, when the, when the Torah says 318, it can't be saying Eliezer, because it doesn't speak that way. Now, he would take it the other way, too. If it said Eliezer, and you would say, oh, Eliezer, that's 318, and 318 is a very mystical word, because it's a, it's a, it's a great number, he would say, Torah doesn't speak that way. So Ibn Ezra seems to be, uh, to be making light of the whole concept of gematria in this. He would say it's a midrashic thing, and he has, he has nothing against midrash, but he would say there's, di there's a difference between the simple meaning of the text and that which you would derive by midrash. Obviously, everybody knows it's cute, but it's not the main uh, meaning of the text. Rashi, by the way, is not a ra rationalist per se. He's a rabbinic Jew, and he's, he's got the, uh, the, the Talmud and the Midrash. So he quotes this idea of the 318 is Eliezer. So there's an example of, both an example of, of gematria, uh, of a certain type. Uh, it's not saying that there's a certain word, and it has numer numerology. It's taking a number and saying that it has a certain word. You see how this is backward? Usually numerology takes a word and says, oh, that word has a certain numeric value. Let's say it's 613. Oh, that's great, 613, that's how many mitzvahs there are. But here we have a number in the Torah, 318 men, and we turn it into a person. Okay? By the way, they can even take a, a nose or, or an arm and turn it into a letter. So it's very, uh, very fungible. Yes? So would Rashi then actually say, that just Abraham and Eliezer and the other minor kings defeated all the other troops. Right. Themselves. Certainly midrashically. Right. I'm sure Rashi also, I have to look at the Rashi more carefully. But in general, Rashi also knows the difference between the simple meaning and not the simple meaning. But uh, he said, one of my professors, Professor Twito, he said, so, so why does Rashi quote the Midrash so much, like 85% of the time? He says, when there's a Midrash, it's just so delicious, he has to quote it. So he says, it's so perfect. I mean, he, he, his, his right-hand man is Eliezer, and his, the gematria of it is 318, and it says he took 318 with him, meaning he took Agent 318, right? He took, he took him with him. Okay. But how could logically that have happened? Right, right. So, if you're not a, right. so if you're not a rationalist, you're dealing with a miraculous, Abraham clearly defeated the enemy with a miracle anyway. Why, did, why should he bother having 300? Let him just do it with one, right, with two. Now, there's a, there's a, the Maharal tried to put the rational and the irrational together. He said, there were 318 men, but they were really an expression of Eliezer. In other words, Eliezer was good enough to defeat them all, but you know, just, just to make it look good, he had the troops out there to make it look scary. Uh, but really, it was, it was the power of Eliezer that really did it. And that kind of brings together the, the Midrashic and, this, and the simple meaning together. Moving along. So, so Ibn Ezra said it's not serious. The Mishnah in Perki Avos, according to most interpretation except for the Maral, said it's not so serious. It's not a serious method. The best, now if we want to test this, we want to know if it's really serious or not, we want to know can you ever derive a law from Gematria? Can you say, well, this is numerology, so therefore that's the law. And we as Jews will, will base our practice on what the gematria, the numerology, says. If, if you could do that, that would prove for sure that numerology is a serious uh, adventure. If, however, we could show that we never derive laws from numerology, then we'll say, you know, it's one of these nice things, it's cute, it's nice. Uh, I'm sure God will reward us for engaging in Torah, but it's not really the body of Torah. It's the fun uh, crumbs and, and all that kind of other uh, metaphors we use. So there's, there's a concept in, in the Torah called the Nazarite. The Nazarite takes a vow, and if he, calls himself a, he or she calls himself a Nazarite, then they cannot cut their hair. They cannot drink wine or anything related to wine. Grapes also, grape seeds, right? Vodka from grape seeds. Um, and they can have a schnapps, though. They could have a schnapps. They just cannot have wine or anything from it. And uh, then they can have co come in contact with the dead. Yeah. 
like a high priest, no funerals, not even for their parents, nobody. So, that's right. They're like a high priest, they, they become like a high priest. They're, they're right. They're higher, the, 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 there's more strict than a regular Kohen. That's correct. Now, so let's say somebody says, I'm a Nazarite. So we say, for how long? Oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. Oh, sorry, you're a Nazarite for the rest of your life. Oh, I didn't mean that. Well, how, mean, how long did you mean? I, I meant for a while. Well, how long is a while? So, well, we have to have laws. If someone says they're a Nazarite, which people apparently used to do all the time, then what does it mean that he's a Nazarite? So comes the Mishnah and says, Stam nizirut shloshim yom. The Mishnah, the beginning of the Talmud, says, unspecified term of being a Nazarite, 30 days. Why? People take a haircut, how often? Every 30 days. If you don't, you have to go, no, no. But the, <laughs> the Kohen should take it more often. A, a, a king should take one every day, right? And how, who was that presidential candidate who took a, a $400 haircut? Uh, right, right, very good. So if you're running for president, you have to put the hairspray on every five minutes. <laughs> now, so, so the Gemara dares to ask, well, how do you know that? Because this is serious stuff. This is not, this is not a joke. If you, if you say that after 30 days his Nazarite thing is over, that means even though he vowed to God to be a Nazarite, on the 31st day, he's out there drinking wine and everything. So, if, so we better know that law to be true. So the, the, the Talmud says, where'd you get this from? Where do you know this from? And sure enough, they invoke gematria. Take a look. From where do we know this? Rav Matna said, the verse says, he shall be holy. Kadoshiya. He shall be, yihye. The word yihye, it sounds a little bit like Hashem's name, like the Tetragrammaton. Yihye, yud, hey. And then it has another yud and then hey. He shall is the gematria of 30. The yud is 10, right? And then he is 5. And then, and, then, uh, uh, and then another yud is 10. And then another 5. So it's 30. So that's how we know that if you're a Nazarite, you're you shall be holy. Shall be is 30. So you, you, uh, 30 days, you're stuck being a Nazarite. Now, if you said you were a Nazarite for a year or for life, then you're a Nazarite for life. But if you didn't say anything, then you're just 30 days. Bar Pada doesn't agree. Bar Pada, the son of Pada, he says no. It corresponds to the number of times, also a type of numerology, different type, uh, the number of times the word Nazir, Nizro, or anything like that, the root Nazir, is mentioned in this section of the Torah. There's a whole section, Torah, I forget, is it chapter 6 or whatever it is, in Nas Parsha Naso, in the Book of Numbers. And, uh, and there, the word Nazirite obviously comes up a lot in the discussion of the laws of the Nazirite. And it happens to be 39. Actually, it's 29. It happens to be it's 29. According to him, it's only 29. And then they have a whole discussion. That, is he a Nazirite for 30 days or 29 days? Okay. But they don't resolve, you know, which one they agree with. So here we seem to have a very serious law derived from a gematria. And you could even say the other fellow who's counting the number of times that the word Nazar is mentioned, it's a type of gematria, it's not really, but it's, it's, sort of, it's related to gematria, that you count how many times something is mentioned, and that gives you an answer to a Jewish legal question. So now we need to look at the medieval commentators, what we call the Rishonim, when, you know, when, when we, talk, when we want to insult someone, we say, oh, it's so medieval. In, in Torah, when you call someone medieval, you say, oh, those are the real, you know, that's the, the medieval scholar. The, 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 the Rashi, the Rambam. So the main commentaries on the Talmud, uh, we tend to look to the people who lived from Rashi's time until the Code of Jewish Law, from 1,000 to 500. That's considered the Rishonim, the first, the first rabbis. So let's take a look. There are two major authorities, one in, one in Spain, who started it was a Sephardic Jew, the Rambam, and one Ashkenazic Jew, the Rush. Both of them had to flee their, their homes. Oh, one second. Uh, the, let's look at the Rambam and the Rush and see what do they say is it serious or is it not? Is this really the source for this very important law? Yes. I was going to say that it still seems too cute because why did they choose that one word, yeah, yeah mm. instead of choosing the word Nazir, which doesn't come out to third? Right, but uh, he, he, holy but he shall be. I'll tell you, so words. it's a good question. What does this word have to do with how long? But the question is, how, how long will he be a Nazirite? So, Holy he shall be. And he shall be. The word he shall be is 30. So he shall be 30 days. I understand it, that. Yeah. But it seems like... No, it's not arbitrary. That, it's that's almost arbitrary. 
Nazir instead of Nazir? Because that's what he is. No, it doesn't mean that a Nazirite is only 30 days. It's only, right. A Nazirite could be forever. So I don't know if the Nazir is, is associated per se with 30, it's just when he just says, I will be. If a person says, I will be a Nazir, a Nazir. Yeah. But, but, uh, but uh, Steve is on, Dr. Steve is onto something that, uh, that there's an element of arbitrariness. And um, it, you know, if you ask yourself, is this very convincing? The other one was, was kind of surprising. Like, wow, that's his major servant. And it's 318, and it's, you know, it lines up. But here you say, it will be, you know, sort of like the word is. You know, like, but then again, in the Torah, we always say, there's no is it. You know, there's no just words that are just there because uh, they have to be there. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting question. Now, could you have skipped the word? Kadosh, not really. Uh, I'm not sure you could skip the word. Interesting question. Well, actually, the Rambam and the Rosh agree with, with Dr. Katz. Because the Rambam says, they, regarding this Mishnah, he says, the Rambam, one of his first works was to explain the Mishnah. So he says, they supported this principle that unspecified Nazarite terms are 30 days. I'm on page 3. To that which it says, he shall be, which is 30. The matter is a tradition. It's really a tradition. Don't think we got the law from here. We know this 30-day thing from a tradition. Know, be it from Moses or from wherever it's from. It's a, it's a tradition. But they connected it as a type of symbol or remembrance. Now, how are you going to remember how many days? So oh, yeah, 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 uh, 30. So it's more of a, just a mnemonic or something like that. The rush, same thing. He says, it seems to me that it's a tradition that they learn that they learn. It's not clear whether he means from Sinai, special tradition. Some traditions in the Talmud we attribute to Sinai, that Moses taught it, oral tradition. Or he just means it's an old tradition. But notice, the, the difference between the Rambam and the Rush is, the Rambam asserts that this is not serious. The Rush says, it seems to me. Meaning? Possibly. Possibly. He's wondering. He's not, he's not sure himself. There are other cases where the rabbis invoke um, gematria in Jewish law. I think this is the most serious case. Um, and yet, two of the major commentators and, uh, said that it's not, not serious. And I couldn't find any other commentators who said it was serious. So the general consensus is there's no law in the Talmud derived from gematria. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have significance, but in terms of legal, legal significance, it's hard to say that any law is germinated purely through numerology and nothing else, out of thin air and, 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 and numerology. Okay. Now, um, the, the Rosh said something else that was interesting. He says, you know why it's not serious? Because it's not one of the... The, the, 13, the, the 13 principles of Rabbi Ishmael. I said every morning we say that Rabbi Ishmael says there are 13 principles of Midrash, and we list them. It's not one of them. If it's not one of the 13, it's not important. What about the 32? Apparently, the 32 are not so serious. That's his view. That, so that's also interesting. Yes, it does. Yes. That's a good point. <laughs> that's true. All right, the other, uh, the other number, uh, not so significant. Okay, now, um, uh, Rashbat adds one other element of why, he says, if it's not serious, then what are they doing? What are the rabbis doing? What do you mean it's not serious? Are they telling them some kind of joke? I mean, what, 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 why would, if they ask, what's the source, and they give an answer, you think it's some kind of an answer. What is this? So he says, well, Ratzula Chadeda Talmidim, the Rashbats of Algeria, he says, they're trying to sharpen the, the students to connect this to a gematria. It's a way of sharpening the students. That goes back to our very first point, that it, it, it enhances wisdom, right? It's a good thing to let the kids do some math. You know, if, if, you, <laughs> if you had a, a curriculum that was purely Torah, right, you could get in a little geometry when you're studying about an Eru, and you get in a little bit with a sukkah, and you get in a little math when it, uh, here, and you'll keep the kids sharp, and it'll be great. So we wanted to sharpen the students. So uh, uh, again, not taking it too seriously. Now, to add to this argument that we can't take it too seriously is gematria and history. We have to recognize that we're not the only people who did gematria. I know it's hard to admit that we're not the only ones, or, you know, 
but, uh, but, but, but there are other people who did gematria. As far back as our good friend Saragon II. So who is he? Well, I had to, to research that. Oops, he's the father of Sancheir. Sancheir was the one who wiped out the northern ten lost tribes. And he almost wiped out everybody, he almost wiped out Jerusalem too. But Jerusalem stood, stood firm under Chizkiah. And you know, we just found a, a coin that was minted by Chizkiah. People, you know, so he was a real, a real guy, you know. And, um, and it says there that he built the wall of that city, I can't pronounce, a certain number of cubits long to correspond to the numerical value of his name. So in Assyrian, it was, it, it was a beautiful uh, gematria of the, the length of the wall and his name. So, so we're not the only ones. That, you know, if you want to take a historical approach, that, it, it, it undermines it a little bit. It's not, such a, it's not a purely Jewish thing. Other people use it. And also, why does it undermine it a little bit? Because, you know, it becomes silly. Yeah. Which came first? Uh, which came first, right? Right, we, we, we don't know. The fact is, we don't have... There's no Midrashic literature from the early Second Temple period for, or from the late First Temple period. So it's just hard to know. But we're going to see later. We're going to see later that there's some gematria in the Bible itself. We'll get to that later. So stay tuned. Now, um, now, now another way of, of sort of undermining gematria, that Ibn Ezra mentioned that sometimes you could make a gematria to take something good to be bad. For instance, Paro and Moshe, uh, I think later on we'll say that, that Paro and Moshe, I think, have the same gematria. Paro and Moshe, something like that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that, that, that is a, problem, a little problem there, right? So if, if you take gematria seriously, you could make something good into something bad, something bad into something good. And along those lines, what are we going to do? We, actually, Paro has ten, is 10 more. Uh, so th we'll, we'll talk about that later. Oh, God willing. But it's, it's close, right? Power is close, it's close to motion. So just to show that it, it can be used for what we would consider frivolous purposes, there was an epistle of Barnabas. I don't know much about it, but apparently he's a second century Christian. And uh, he has this long epistle. And in it, he makes a gematria apparently in Greek. Not in, not in, not in Hebrew, not in, not in English. Uh, it's, it's in Greek. Uh, to say that, that, uh, that the founder of the Christian religion his name uh, could come from the 318 that, that Abraham took with him. He took the cross with him, you know? He took the 318 with... He, the name of the founder of that religion is, um, is equivalent, he says, to this. I don't know, it must be in Greek because it doesn't work in Hebrew unless, unless his Hebrew name was Yichash. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... Apparently, in Greek, it works beautifully. Alpha is one, beta is two, gamma is three, etc. As I don't, I don't know the alphabet too well. So apparently, it works in Greek. So anyway, something like this has to give you pause. If you're going to take gematria seriously, what about Christian gematria? What about what about Shabtai Tzvi? In the uh, 1600s, the, uh, there was a false messiah, and uh, and he brought many gematria proofs that he was the messiah. I'm still waiting, you know, so 300 years later for him to save us. But uh, it said in the Gematria that he was. So we're going to see later that someone, one of, his, one, of the contempor one of his contemporaries said, you've got to be careful with this Gematria business. Okay. Now, so what does this tell me about Gematria? We have to be careful with Gematria. We're going to have to put some brakes on it. Otherwise, you can make a Gematria to say that we should all, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, Climb the roof or something like that. Climb the walls. Okay. Uh, now, <clears throat> you could say, now let's, let's try to transition to, uh, to perhaps somewhere in the middle. That is important, but yeah. So Gershon Shalom was a famous uh, scholar of mysticism. He's not a mystic, but he's a scholar of mysticism. Uh, he said that, no doubt, some gave it a real value higher than that of a mere support for an existing idea. That's what we've been talking about until now. It's called, the technical term for it is asmachta. That sometimes you take a law and you lean it on a word, on a midrash. Right? You, take, you take a thought and you lean it on a word. You say, it's not really connected to that word. It's not what the word means. But you take a rabbinic idea and you lean it on a, on a, on a word in the Torah. So some people say that whatever idea you want to derive from numerology, you're just leaning on the verse. It's not really there. 
he says, there's no doubt that some rabbis, a lot of rabbis, when they use numerology, they don't just mean it as a game. They don't just mean it just for fun. They don't just mean that they're just leaning as support. They're, they're, they think that the word is like talking to them using numerology. So there's no question that many people take it more seriously. So let's go in that direction. Rabbi Yaakov Emden, living at the, t uh, at the time of some of the, where some of the followers of, of Shabtai Tzvi still believed that Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah, even though he was dead, and even though he had become a Muslim, not in that order. Um, <laughs> um, but they still believed in him, and he was, he was on a crusader against those Jews who still believed Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah. So he says, you know, these gematrias that these people make, these, these followers of Shabtai Tzvi, Allah Shalom, he says, um, he says, it's no good. He says, Gematria is only given to the true sages and only to support what is known and not to make anything new. So it's kind of disappointing, right? Oh, so you can't learn anything new from Gematria. You can only just support things you knew already. Like you knew that a Nazarite is for 30 days. So you can support it with a word in that section that's 30, that, that adds up to 30. But you can't, if, you, if, if Moses told you 30, 32 days, you can't find a verse that says 30 and change the law to something else. And presumably you can't make up new messiahs or anything else. Uh, you have to be sort of a scholar. There, there is a similar idea with one of the famous hermeneutic principles. Uh, we talked about the 13 principles, which are more serious. One of the very serious ones is that if in this section of the Torah it says a certain word, and then in this section of the Torah it says the same word, then just like the laws over here are such and such, that law should pertain to that section also because they have a common word. In other words, they're both sections that have some weird expression in it. Oh, why do they have the same weird expression in both laws? Because these two laws are similar. That law is a very serious law. Many serious things like getting married. This is, I didn't, okay. In Orthodoxy, you get married. <laughs> the wife's ring is the, is, the, is, is the ring that consummates the marriage. But, but, uh, but when you give a ring, that law, believe it or not, is derived by this methodology. How do we know you can get married with a ring or something of value? It comes from this methodology that it says you should t take a woman, and it talks about Abraham taking the first acquisition in the land of Israel when he bought the tomb of the patriarchs for his wife. And uh, he, took, he took that with something of value. He gave a lot of money for the tomb of the patriarchs. So too, when you take a wife, you've got to give her something of value. Could be a bag of gold, or it could be a golden ring or something else. So this methodology is very serious. And the, and the rabbis say, this methodology can only be used with, with tradition, tradition. You have to have a tradition that you can link this word with that word. If your rebbe didn't tell you that you can link these words, you can't link these words. You can't make your... So the, the Rabbi Yaakov Emden, in the, in the was it, 1700s or what, he's... Uh, saying the same thing about gematria. That gematria is not just something anybody can make. It has to be from some kind of a tradition. Now clearly most people didn't follow this rule, but that's the rule that he thought should be followed. Then we have a tzitzis problem. We all know the tzitzis, right? You have uh, right, some tzitzis over here. Under my shirt, of course, I have tzitzis too. Well, let's look at this one. And right, you have these strings. So you look at this and it reminds you of all the mitzvahs of Hashem. Does it? Why does this remind you of all the mitzvahs of Hashem, right? So you can say, well, you know, you know I have a, a little uh, I have a pen in my pocket. It's to remind me that I have to write something to my wife later. You know, uh, I, have, uh, I put my, my ring on my, uh, the wrong finger today to remind me. So whenever I see the tzitzis, uh, it doesn't say mitzvahs of Hashem anywhere, but, but it, you know, everybody knows that this reminds you of the mitzvahs of Hashem. So Rashi says, I don't know, that doesn't, that's not very appealing. He says, what do you mean? The word tzitzit, if you spell it the right way, not the way it's spelled in the Torah, but if you spell it the way Rashi wants to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, now, true. now, we're not sure. The words in the Torah, in this Torah, are the same as the word in any other Torah around, around the globe, except for one letter. The Sephardic Jews have one, one letter, an aleph, a hey. It's the same Torah. But over the centuries, one thing we're not so sure is how many yuds to put in. Like, do you say tzit, tzit with two yuds? Or you say tzit, tzit, you don't need a yud. You just say tzit, 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 like in a short eye. 
So even though in our Torah it doesn't say two yuds, and it doesn't add up to 600, um, you could argue that our Torahs are imperfect, and maybe it should have two yuds. Uh, so it's not clear. Now, so we've already got 600. So the, if I see tzitzit, numerod, numerologically, it tells me 600. But I don't want 600. I want 13. 613. So he says, easy. So you've got how many strings, right? You've got one, right? Two, right? Three. We've got eight strings. Eight strings. It's really four strings, but when you, when you put it, you, you put it, you, you double it over. So you've got eight strings. And how short are we? How many do we need now to get to 613? Five. Five. Watch this. One knot. Two knots, three knots, four knots, five knots. So we've got, okay. Come now. So I call, but I call it the tzitzis process. So Rashi says, that's how you remember it. So let's take a look at how some of the commentaries. He says, among the mitzvot of tzitzis, he says, he says, Rabbeinu Bach, a student of the Ramban, he says, but it's known to any scholar that it's not the, that it is the root of all mitzvot and the rabbis associated the tradition with the gematria. So it will be a sign and a testimony to the tradition. He says, that's not why it's, I remember the mitzvot. That just reminds me of what it is. The tzitzis remind you of the mitzvot. That numerology reminds you of what you're supposed to remember. Rabbi, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Yol Circus goes kind of hard-hitting against the gematrias, and he says, I like him because his name is Rabbi Yol. He says, <laughs> He says, it's not the fact that it's 613 that makes it compatible to all the comfortable zones. For there's no advantage in a word of what, numerolo what is numerology, of what it is in numerology. Can you believe it? In a class like this, he says something like that. Um, that he says, there's no advantage. So, so what, who cares what, what, word, what word it is? He says, it's, it's something else. But the, um, the Maharal says, he says, the Ramban asked the question. He says, you're wrong. You, the Talmud says you don't need it. You don't need five, uh, five knots. You could have one. How could you have one? It wouldn't remind you of the right number. And Beit Be Be Hillel, you could only, you'd only need three strings, which adds to six. So he says, well, there are windings here. You see, they have windings. You wind it around. Little winding. So there are 13 windings. But some people only have seven. Ah, but in between the seven, there are six spaces. Seven and 13. <laughs> seven and six is 13. So, uh, so he realizes that the Rashi's uh, numerology is based on our current practice of tzitzis, not the ancient Talmudic practice of tzitzis. So we got a, a little bit of a problem there, uh, but he solved the problem with the raps. Now then I can show you that actually gematria, and that, so, so far, we had people who said it's totally not serious. We had people who said it's serious, but uh, it, it's, it's just a support for things in the Torah, but it's not actually uh, the, the actual source. You know, the, uh, Yaakov Emden said you have to be very scholarly in order to make, this to make these interpretations. And now let's move to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, stronger position that Gematria is very serious. So firstly, are there gematrias in the Bible itself? What do I mean? Sort of internally. So yeah, there's a verse in Jeremiah where it refers to the king of Sheshach. What's Sheshach? We don't know the country named Sheshach. What do you mean the king of Sheshach? So if you take the letters on page five, and you, the first letter, you connect with the last letter. Second letter, the second to last letter. So Aleph goes with Taf, Bet goes with Shin. So Sheshach has got two Shins. So instead of two Shins, now it's got two bets. Kaf is associated with Lamed. So Sheshach, instead of a Chaf, turns into a Lamed. So Sheshach becomes Bavel. So we see that the Torah, Jeremiah, spoke in Gematria. A certain type of Gematria. Now, same thing in, in Jeremiah 51. It says, I will stir up the spirit of a destroyer against Babylonia, against all the inhabitants of Leb Kamai. What's Leb Kamai? So if you use the same uh, methodology again, Lamed is Chav, Bet, a Bet is Shin, so that's Kaz, Kas. Uh, Kuf is Dalet, Mem is Yud, and Yud is Mem. 
So Kasdim. Kasdim or the Chaldeans. So the word Lev Kamai actually means Kasdim. Chaldeans. Babylonians. So uh, in the Bible itself, you can find two examples of this. And then, uh, then uh, um, one time, you know the expression, you can see the writing on the wall? You know where that's from? Daniel. A, one time, a, the, the king was very drunk, and he saw a hand that came from the sky and, and wrote on the wall. And nobody could read it. So, so he read it. So he said, why could nobody read it? Daniel knew how to read it. No, no one else could read it. What was the problem? So it was the wrong script. It was in Hebrew. So some people say it was in Gematria. It was in Gematria, or Atbash, this methodology of the first letter is equal to the last letter, the second letter is equal to the second to the last letter, something like that. That's one interpretation in the Talmud. Finally, one other place in the Torah it might, it might be lurking is a Hazinu. The end of, the, of Moshe's life, he, he sings a song about the history and the future of the Jewish people. The song, we know in medieval poetry, songs often begin, often have acrostics for the author's name. So if you look at the beginning of this song, it starts with a he, the acrostic of the first six, six words, six sentences. See on the bottom of page five? You have a he and a yud, that's 15. A chaf, that's 25. And then another uh, he, that's, uh, that's 35, 35, 40. So it's 5, 10, 20, that's uh, 35, and then another 5 is, is 40. Well, in the letter Moshe, a mem is 40. And then you have a shin, and then you have a hey. So in Moses' poem, it begins with an acrostic of the numerology of his name. Some people find that convincing, interesting. In any event, that's about as close as you get in the Torah itself to numerology. Now, as to rabbis who really feel that numerology is very serious, let's turn first to the Ramban, Nachmanides. He was an early mystic. Before the Zohar came out, he had his own mysticism, of, uh, secret mysticism. Yes? I'm sorry. Yes? Not the, the drift, wrong. But why would Jeremiah have put the other country's names in Gematria instead of spelling them out? Was there some danger in spelling out the actual names? Hmm. No, actually in the parallelism, he does spell out the name. So it's interesting. Yes, it's a good question why he would do that. Right. You have to look at right, whether some scholars say, oh, Sheshach, we found it, we know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. Um, also, there's a, a, a Zubavel, one of the first uh, leaders of the Jewish people in the Second Temple. Uh, some say it's the same as, as uh, what is it? Belshazzar. Belshazzar, Zubavel. There are two leaders of the Jews. When the Jews come back to Israel, they're being led by Zubavel. No, Belshazzar. So, who is it? They say maybe it's a, by numerology, it's the same person. Okay. But in any event, um, Nachmanides. As I said, he was a bit of a mystic, but he, he's so mystical, he doesn't tell us what, what his mystical ideas are, but he gives us little hints. So this much he's going to tell us. Introduction to the Torah, he says, and anything which was given to Moshe in the gates of wisdom, he got 50 gates of wisdom, is all written explicitly in the Torah. Everything Moses knows in the Torah, come on, everything Moses knows in the Torah, I mean, that's it. You read the Bible, that's it. The, what about the Talmud, the Midrash, everything? Uh, where is it in the Torah? He says, no, it's there. It's either explicitly in the Torah, or it's hinted to in the letters of Grammatrias, or in the shapes of the letters, that's a whole different kind of thing, which are written properly, or which change such as crooked letters and twisted letters. My teacher at, at Yeshiva University, Rabbi Horowitz, uh, used to collect different things from around the world, and he had pieces of, of parchment from the Torahs where the letters were, were what we would call wrong. Instead of a pay, like this, the pay was written like this. It was in the middle, the middle curl of curlicue didn't go around once, it went around several times. Uh, and there were other odd letters, and this was a scribal tradition that certain letters should be written in certain unusual ways to tell us certain secrets that are in the Torah. Was it just for one? Right, it was... Right, right, right. It wasn't per, right. There were, we don't have that many of these Torahs, but apparently some scribes had that tradition, and it's been lost and it's so much so that modern rabbis say, "What kind of Torah is this? It's got the weird pay. It's not, it's not kosher." And probably it's the other way around. Our Torahs don't have the, the, the cool traditions of the weird letters, but some of these old Torahs did. But in any event, the Ramban goes on to say, 
it's a tradition of truth, meaning mysticism, in our hands, that all the Torah is the names of God. Oh, uh, now we get into a different idea. That the Torah is really, it's not, we, we open the Torah, we say, oh, wow, the Bible, that's so exciting, let me read about that. A tree, and they killed somebody, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and then, right, and they're fighting about it, about going out of Egypt, and uh, the frogs. Doesn't seem that exciting. He says, nah, that's, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. He says, it's all names of God. The whole, the whole thing is just names of God. For the, so he says, that doesn't look like a name of God to me. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't, he says, no, you can break it up differently. Bereshit, in the, the Genesis, in the beginning, you could say it's Bereshit bara. You could break the letters up differently. You could, you could read it differently. So the whole Torah is, uh, so aside from the combination of the gematria, the names and the names that can be made by using letters of succeeding, of succeeding verses lined up, you could take three verses, line them up, and then take an acrostic down from, e from each of, of the three verses and find names of God there also. And that's, there's one famous place where we find one of the 72 names of God from a particular verse in last week's Parsha. Three verses we line up. And we use one of the, two of the secret names on Sukkos. But in any event, and because of this, if there's one letter missing, it's not kosher. You say, whoa, one letter? What difference does it make? If there's one letter, it's scratched out. Oh, it's not kosher. So, you know, we have to take out a different Torah. What's the big deal? Maybe it's a letter that doesn't make a difference. You can still read the Torah. He said, no, because you just crossed out one of the names of God. So now, <laughs> that's what we should all say. Oh, so now, so now we're beginning to get somewhere else. And if we say, that the letters of the Torah are not, it's a, it, Ibn Ezra, you're all wrong. It's not talking about what kind of war that, uh, that Abraham won. There's so many other things hiding in there. And, uh, and certainly the idea that, that Eliezer could, is worthy of beating everybody, that would be a worthy idea. And there are millions of other, other ideas. Um, he says, if someone will say that Gematria is nothing, says the Ramban, vanity. So he knew that people like to make fun of Gematria, because, you know, you could make a gematria for something silly, as we'll show later. Um, because you can make it for bad and strange things. We respond, no one can calculate gematria in order to deduce it from anything that occurs to him. Same as the rabbi from the 1700s. Our rabbis, the holy sages, had a tradition that the definite gematria were transmitted to Moses to serve as a mnemonic for something that had been handed down orally, just as was the case of Zereshava, the other hermeneutics, the principle of the third, or the, one of the 13 principles I mentioned before. Moving on a little bit along these lines, we have the Shalah. Shalah Kadosh, he got the smicha from, from, the author, the, from Rabbi Yosef Karo. He was a big mystic. And uh, he says, there's no end to the number of permutations of a letter that you can make and to switch each of the 22 letters. Right? Every letter can be changed for something else. Right? Like, right, like, you're ever amazed that in New York City you have seven numbers for the phone book, right? For every, and you have millions of people. And they all use these seven numbers because you could switch them around. So too, every letter in the Torah could be switched with any one of the 22 letters. And, you know, so there's infinite number of things written in the Torah. It's not the book that you think it is. So he says, there's no end. Why is there no end? He says, for the Torah is the impression of God. You're looking at the Torah, you're looking at, it's like a shadow of God, so to speak. And God has no end. And the world is an impression of the Torah. As the sages of the Zohar say, the Holy One, blessed be, looked in the Torah and created the world. So the world is a shadow of the Torah. The Torah is a shadow of God. And God is infinite. So there's infinite stuff. You never run out of stuff uh, in the Torah. There's always, always more. And the Gematria would be an example of that uh, infinite, infinity of stuff that's there. Yes? Along that line, so thinking that it was infinite. <laughs> Introduction of computers. Yes. I assume that yes. the number of uh, grammatical words, connections, and so on. Right. 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 The problem again is, we'll see later that uh, that sometimes it can get silly because you get, right. So you have to decide what makes sense. Let's say if you plug in, you, there's a gematria program. You, you can get it online. You can buy the Barry Line one. Take the gematria program, and you plug in, let's say, your name, and it comes up with seven verses that are similar. Now you have to decide which verse are you going to pick? The verse that says you're, you're all doomed, you know, or the verse that says, you know, you will inherit the world, you know. So, uh, right, so you have, to use, have to, have, you have to go to the Rebbe. Right. <laughs> so it's interesting. Now, um, 
Uh, Salman Shetra was a scholar. He, he co-authored an article that got online, and he says the following. Listen to this. So this, this is, this is uh, more classic Kabbalah, if you're looking for that. All creation has developed through emanations from the Ein Sof. So there's the God who is the infinite, who is uh, indescribable. Then he sort of filters through to another layer where you can vaguely, you, 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 there are angels and spiritual beings. Filters down to another layer where you know, there are ideas and thoughts. And then another layer. And finally, you get to the very concrete world in which we live. Right? So the first degrees of that evolution are the ten spherot, the ten uh, reflections from God. From the last of which, kingdom, or, or keter, or, or, or malchus, develop the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So at the, after all the emanations you go through, you get to, you get to the, the lowest level, and from those levels, you get the Hebrew alphabet. So the Hebrew alphabet is an emanation from God. The, the letters themselves come from God. Through the latter, the whole, uh, the, the whole finite world has come into existence. Through the Hebrew alphabet, that, that was part of the filter through which the world came. Well, again, we saw it in the Zohar. It's a simple statement. God looked at the Torah, and he made the world. The Zohar is saying, and then now, now uh, uh, Shalom Shatter is saying, that the, uh, the prism through which the world was created was the infinite God, which is so different from us, it's not even funny. There's no connection. So then it filters down, and then through all the different reflections of God and glory and stuff like that, and then it filters down to the letters, and from the letters, that's where the world, come, the world comes from the letters. Since these powers are numbers, you see, uh, though, though the, uh, let's see, these letters are dynamic powers. Since these powers are numbers, everything has sprung from them in number, is a number. So we, we come from, from numbers, and the number tells us something about ourselves because we all come from the numbers. So there's your mystical aspect of the gematria. Now, um, let's see. I know some people have to go soon. Let me tell, let's, let's see what we have to do here. We have numerous examples of numerology, and then a predictive numerology, and then our schedule for next week. Okay, so are you ready? Let's take a few cool, cool ones, okay? So I noticed that Rabbi the Chida, Rabbi Chaim Yosef David, he had three names, Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai was a, was a mystic and a rabbi, and an itinerant preacher, he was everywhere, he was in Egypt, he was in Tzfat, he was in, in, uh, he was in, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, every time he got kicked out of the previous job, it gave him time to write, so he wrote another book. So he wrote a book on the whole Torah, at least according to my, uh, you know, Googling or whatever it is, at least 180 gematrias he, he came up with on his own. And some of them, look how cool they are. The word Breshit, the first word in the Bible, in the beginning, he says it's the same as Taryag, 613, and Shabbat. Because Shabbat is equal to all the 613. Um, Sarah was really the ultimate woman, so she was like Chava. So when it says Abraham came, to, he, why did he come? He came to, uh, to, to eulogize his wife. And he came, vayavo, it's chava. It's chava. Cool. Then you got more complicated ones. Moshe is really Hevel. Remember, Cain killed Abel. Moses, so what happened to Abel? What happened to Hevel? Oh, he came back. He's Moses. Okay? So he's Moses. And, and Paro is, is Cain. And therefore, the gematria of, of Paro is Moshe, but Paro's got 10 more letters. So Paro thought he could beat Mos Moshe with his 10, but instead we beat him with our 10, with the 10 plagues. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> he says, uh, you know, bris mila? Bri you don't just say you go to the bris, you go to bris mila. Bris mila. So mila means the bris. So Mila and Tzor, you know, Tzor, Tzor, you know, Tzor, the rock, the rock of Israel, Tzor Israel, Tzor is a rock. Mila Tzor, the rock, Bris, is the same gematria as Sipora, who gave her son a Bris with a rock. Um, <clears throat> the, um, this week's Parsha, the last words on the last page, the last letters in the commandment, the Ten Commandments, Kabed et Avicha, honor your father, Right? The last letters there are 424. It's a dalid, a taf, and a, and a, and a 20. Uh, a chaf is 424. 424 um, is the same as 
Mashiach ben David, the son, Messiah, son of David, because if we honor our parents, hopefully the Mashiach will come. Um, it goes on and on. Um, it, goes, it goes on and on. Uh, you know, you know uh, Hanoch who went off to heaven? You know, there was a fellow, Enoch, he, he, he died, he, he only lived 300 and something years, you know, a, a poor guy, you know, and, and God took him, he wasn't anymore. He says, and he says, um, for God took him. The gematria of for God took him is the same gematria as Eliyahu, who's the only other person we know who went off to heaven. So it's all, it's all cool stuff. Now, sometimes you're short one. You get to, you get to something and then you're short, you're short one. So, uh, so what do you do? So you're allowed to, so there's a verse that says, Ephraim and Menashe are like Ruvain and Shimon. But they're not. The numerology is one off. So he said, no. Jacob said that Ephraim and Menashe is just like Ruvain and Shimon. Even though they're one off, still good enough. That's, so you could be one off because the word itself is one. The word itself is one, so that's, that's the other one. And there are all kinds of rules like that. Um, and let's give you, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, you, know, you know, David stole Bathsheba. But the rabbi said, oh, if he had just waited, his, somehow they would have come together legally instead of illegally. So therefore, the gematria of one of his ribs is the same as Bathsheba was his bashert. Ru'uya uh, lo Bathsheba. So it goes on and on. Now, just to show, now, let's take a little, uh, so we've, we've shown, we've shown that some rabbis view gematria as very dangerous and perhaps uh, could go in the wrong directions. Some rabbis view it as very important, but should only be done by certain, by, you know, by an adult and by, uh, by, by uh, 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 certified rabbis who have tr certified traditions. And then those who view gematria as part of the mystical expression of the Torah, which is simply an expression of godliness and which has infinite meanings. And numerology is one, one expression of that because the letters are the building blocks of of, uh, of the whole world and have a latent power that comes directly from God. So I hope you appreciate that gematria is perhaps in the realm of the mystical and therefore some rabbis are more mystical and more inclined to it and some rabbis are less and less inclined to it. <laughs> Next week we'll be looking um, more directly at a mystical topic and that is the concept of divine presence. It's a sort of a Jewish idea. That what does it mean that the divine presence is with you? For instance, when there's a minion, the divine presence with you. We're going to talk about that. Third week, We'll be talking against, that's, it's going to be 7.30 every Tuesday coming up. The mysti mystical power of a mitzvah. Okay, maybe we'll come back to some of the concepts from tonight. And finally, our pièce de resistance on February 16th, we'll talk about afterlife and exploring the world to come. Thank you. If there are questions, we can talk privately.